Right, I think we are live. So hi everybody and, um, and thank you for joining us for this webinar on what really is a fantastic day for the beauty industry. Um, I am so, so happy today to be joined by Caroline Noakes, as you can see, who I, I think really needs no introduction to most people in the beauty industry. Um, she's the MP who's been fighting so hard for beauty in Parliament and who really has been instrumental in, in getting us the result that we got today. So Caroline, thank you so, so much for joining us today. That's okay, it's great to be here. And so yeah, as I say, today really is an incredible day for the industry. Just to clarify for anyone who might not have seen the news, um, I think everyone probably has, but we've had clarification today um, that Boris Johnson's briefing earlier did definitely mean that treatments on the face can resume from the 1st of August. Um, and the follow-up guidance, which was published online, stated all close contact services to resume, including any treatments on the face, such as eyebrow threading or makeup application, uh, working closely with the sector and public health experts to ensure this can be done as safely as possible and in line with COVID-19 secure guidelines. So yes, I think really this is the news that everybody's been fighting for and, and I'm waiting for for, for so long. Um, you obviously, Caroline, our associations who work so hard, us here at Professional Beauty have been campaigning and obviously the all party parliamentary group, everybody has been, has been asking for this. So yeah, how, how do you feel about this, <laughs> this success today? Um, just hugely relieved. It's been a massive, massive campaign for me and not not a little bit exhausting, I have to say, but really worthwhile. And I have to say, I've been completely blown away by the amazing people I've met. And when I say met, I mean online, on the phone, via Zoom calls, emails, Facebook messages, Instagram, um, and their incredible stories and their commitment to the industry. So really passionate people who have worked hard uh, in the vast majority of instances, set up their own businesses, taken risks to do that. They've rented premises, they've uh, hired equipment, leased equipment. And for all of them, it's been about the one thing that you all wanted, which was to get back to work. You know, nobody was asking me for anything other than, please let us get back into our salons and studios and get back to work. Absolutely, yeah. And I think um, this change has probably come sooner than, than a lot of people expected. Um, after the announcement on the 9th of July about the reopening from, from 13th with limited treatments. Um, yeah, at the, at the time, obviously, the government said that Public Health England were, were quite convinced that face treatments were not safe at the moment. So I suppose what everyone's wondering, what, what do you think has been the main reason for this change happening now? Well, um, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so I think... When we had the announcement last week, I was very relieved that it was partial reopening. That was definitely steps forward, not backwards. So, um, and at one point on, on Thursday last week, I was absolutely in a trough of despair because I didn't think we were going to get anything. And uh, I was really feeling very negative. So partial reopening was, was a step in the right direction. Um, today's announcement, I think is about a lot of things. It's about making sure that the economy is up and running fully. It's about different government departments having listened to the case that I think was a very important one, that these are businesses that are standing on their own two feet, providing employment, paying tax, contributing to the exchequer, and to not allow services on the face was for many, many businesses chopping out 80% of their income. And I've seen some absolutely heartbreaking uh, emails from people over the course of the last week explaining they may have been from lash technicians where it's 100 percent of their business is on the face uh beauty salon saying well look we can reopen but manicures pedicures waxing so that's only a very limited part of our business so i think part of it is about getting the economy open and i also think the absolutely enormous public outcry last weekend and we all saw the videos and the photographs of men having their beards trimmed, their eyebrows threaded, their noses waxed. I didn't even know that nose waxing was a thing. Um, I, I wish I didn't. I wish I still hadn't seen those videos. <laughs> yeah, it's not pleasant. Um, horrible. But it was just the, the unfairness, the sexism. The, mm -hmm. I don't think it was blatant sexism. I think it was absolutely thoughtless sexism. Uh, and people, there was such an outcry, whether it was from Susanna Reid from GMB, many of uh, significant newspaper columnists were saying, well, hang on a minute, this just isn't fair. That all these services being done by barbers on men's faces, but women's faces aren't allowed. 
and you know, my heart really went out to uh, people with things like polycystic ovary syndrome who weren't able to get uh, facial waxing or electrolysis, to people who had uh, alopecia or cancer sufferers who were just waiting, waiting, waiting for an appointment where they could go and get eyebrows bladed or they could get uh, other procedures just, just to make them feel a bit better about themselves. And I think one of the heartbreaking things for me was, was reading emails from uh, practitioners who just wanted to go back to work and provide those services for women in the main part, but not exclusively women, who were so desperate to have the treatments that they needed, whether it to be to cure migraines or um, various other sort of practices that would just make them feel a bit better about themselves. And so I think we've got equality, finally. We've got a date, which was what I was pestering last week. And just give us a date, Boris. Yeah. Um, and the 1st of August, it may seem a way off, but actually, you know, it's, it's pretty imminent. And so uh, I think good reason to be happy today. Absolutely, absolutely. And for all those reasons that you've mentioned, I think people have been frustrated throughout this that the understanding of the complexity of the beauty industry isn't there, that, you know, it's not just makeup and nails, much as, you know, they're very valid in themselves. There's so much to it, you know, isn't there? And there are so many people that it helps. And I think the fact that that's starting to be recognised is, is fantastic. And I think... Some people are kind of already asking lots of questions, but one thing I know a lot of people are keen to know is, do you think this will apply to the whole of the UK? I think people in England are celebrating hugely today, but Scotland and Wales are still not completely sure. And I know it's not been announced, but do you have any, any thoughts on that? Do you think that this means we're likely to have restri no restrictions there? So this is one of the challenges of devolved government, and that will be for the Welsh Assembly and the Scottish uh, Parliament to decide. I think we've seen uh, from Wales that they tend to lag a little bit behind us. But remember, this announcement has come today for the 1st of August. So there's plenty of time for Wales and Scotland to make the similar changes to guidelines and get the industry up and open there as well. I hope they do. I really hope they do. Uh, and I've had contact from uh, you know, a therapist in Troom in Scotland, several from Cardiff, all wanting answers. And you know, I'm not surprised they want answers. Um, and I think it's important that the devolved governments crack on and let them have the information as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think people are at least given some hope from today's announcement that, you know, if, if, if this has been implemented here, with fingers crossed for, for the rest of the UK very soon. And so I suppose, Caroline, obviously we, you know, we, we discussed a little bit in advance what we were going to talk about today, and that's all gone out the window with the, with the announcement earlier, which is great. But I do just want to, um, to still say, I think, on behalf of probably the whole beauty and spa industry, just a heartfelt thank you for, for everything that you've done to bring us to this point. Um, and I think people just, you know, have, have been, it's, it's a glimmer of hope, you know, we've seen the industry discussed in Parliament and you know as we've kind of uh, not been too happy to see sometimes not um, discussed in the most respectful way sometimes using very outdated language like uh, parlours and, and this sort of thing and to have someone who's standing up for the women that, that really predominantly women that, that run these businesses is, has been so refreshing and so such a positive influence throughout all of this um, so firstly, thank you. <laughs> but, um, secondly, what, what did kind of motivate you to do that? What was it that just made you think, I need to, I need to represent these people? So um, a, a bunch of things. And I think first and foremost, you have to remember that the first time I raised it in Parliament, I had gone into the chamber to talk very specifically about uh, planning restrictions on listed pubs. And it wasn't until I was in there, in the debate, thinking about what I wanted to say on that front. And then I suddenly twigged that the, the title of the debate was Planning and Business. And leading up to it, I'd had um, a sort of a moment the week before when I'd had a text message from my wonderful manicurist at Unique Nails in Romsey saying, you know, sorry, Noxie, I've got to cancel you. We're not allowed to open. And knowing what a devastating impact that would have on their business where it is just uh, nails. And so I knew that there was a whole chunk of uh, the beauty industry that wasn't able to open. I had had emails and messages from 
Pilates instructors, uh, yoga instructors, dance studios, all in my constituency. And the week before, on the, I think on the Thursday, I'd written an article that was later published on Conservative Home, where I was just kind of trying to bring together my thoughts about why is it that we've opened up football, fishing and golf and not dance, yoga and Pilates. And that was really where it started the whole uh, kind of argument that this is a relaxation of lockdown designed by men for men. And uh, so I'd written the article and I knew it was going to be published the following day, but then I'm sat in this debate and thinking, well, actually all of the arguments that I made in that article that's going to be published tomorrow, they're all valid to this debate because they're all about business. And we know that 80% of Pilates instructors are women, that they are, largely, not exclusively, uh, catering to a female clientele. The beauty industry has something like over 90% of the people employed in it are women, and it's 370,000 employees. These, these are massive, massive numbers. Mm -hmm. And it's turning over 28 billion pounds a year. And it, it all sort of coalesced into a hang on, this is about business. This is about enabling every sector of the economy to open up. It's about giving female entrepreneurs, because that absolutely is what the beauty industry is full of, entrepreneurs. Um, and it's about giving them exactly the same breaks as those male-led businesses, the construction sector, which never locked down. Um, and so I, it just, to me, it felt very unfair. And yeah. so I stood there in the chamber without having prepared a single word, without having really thought what I was going to say, and just went, no, you lot are going to get the benefit of my views. Uh, and then it sort of snowballed from there because I was thinking, well, I'm getting glib answers from ministers who aren't really listening. I did a Zoom call with uh, three people, uh, two of them working on uh, aesthetic tattooing and one guy who was just a tattoo I don't mean that just a tattooist he was a an artistic tattooist and that was where the the conversation started about parlors and mm. students and the sort of real 1970s language yeah so it then became a case of every day last week I was looking at that order paper in parliament going where can I raise this what you know what opportunities are coming up and what can I do to get colleagues on board because we had the awful um, you know, perception that Will Rag was sniggering at people, and Will wasn't. Will yeah. was standing up for lush beauty in Hazelgrove and trying to do the right thing, and that all kind of backfired on him. So I thought, well, actually, every time I stand up in that chamber and talk about the beauty industry, I'm going to do it from a position of real seriousness. I'm going to do it from a position of employment, of entrepreneurship, of the massive contribution to GDP that these businesses are making. And you know what? I could, I could have gone on. Every time I stood up in there, I was on some hideous three or four minute time limit. So I had no chance at all to get across the points that I wanted to. And then finally on the Thursday of last week, I got pulled out of the, the ballot to ask a question of the leader of the house in business questions. And I was gonna ask about the beauty industry again. There was absolutely no doubt about it. And I sat there and suddenly we had a question from uh, Martin Vickers from Cleethorpes. There was a question from um, somebody sat at the other end of the chamber. I said, well, they've got it. I've got half a dozen colleagues have all asked the question about the beauty industry in here. My God, they understand. Um, so that, you know, that felt like a real light bulb moment. And let me tell you, over the course of this last week, I've had so many colleagues come up to me uh, and make comments like, where are we going now? What, what are we doing? Whatever you want us to do, we will do. So a hundred colleagues in the end signed the letter to the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many more of them have said, and there's wonderful man uh, who won't mean anything to, to most of the people watching, but Sir David Amos, the MP for South End. David stood up in one of the debates I was in, I think the one on the economy, and started talking about uh, the beauty industry in South End. And on the Thursday, so the following day, he said to me, come on, Caroline, what's next? You, know, you are our leader. We are following you. And I was just, there's this lovely, slightly um, older man. He would probably be very cross with me for saying that. But who is so passionate about beauticians in his constituency saying, you know, Caroline, I, I know nothing about this, but I want to learn. I visited a salon at the weekend. I've had loads of emails from my constituents. You have to show us what more we can do to help. And I just thought, this is it. They get it.
Fantastic. And I think that's the thing, that's what people were finding so frustrating is that most of these people haven't been to a beauty salon. They don't even really know what they are. And, you know, to have someone standing up there and saying, look, there's, there's thousands of them. There's, you know, tens of thousands of them. Like, it's a huge business. I think that that, that was just so, so good to see. So thank you for that. Um, and I think also you touched on um, the, the sort of what was what was seen as the mocking of the industry with, with William Rags comments Boris Johnson. And I think there's not a person in the industry who hasn't seen that, the, the video clip of that. It was widely shared. I know people were tweeting William Rags. And I, I agree that, you know, obviously it came from a good place, but I think just the, the way it was expressed, people were just so disappointed to see that almost as if it was laughable that a man would go to a salon when actually, you know, hundreds, thousands of men go to salon well, every day. So. Um, many of my male colleagues would benefit from a good manicure. Um, and you're dead right, loads of men go to salons. I, my ex-husband used to get his back waxed, um, which was, let me tell you, a public service. Um, so I think, yeah, it, there's just, there has been a level of lack of understanding. But what was really, really interesting was the number of um, female colleagues begging me to keep going and male colleagues going, oh, my wife saw you on Facebook. Um, I go, yes, good, good. Now, what can you do to help? And that's been my kind of my mantra to all colleagues. It's been, well, what are you going to do to help? Are you going to sign my letter to the Prime Minister? Are you going to raise this in business questions? Oh, look, you've got a PMQ this week. Well, you could raise it then. Um, and what I said to all of them, and this is absolutely true, I said, kept saying to them, go to a salon this weekend. I said, you will have had many, many beauty therapists in your constituency contact you. I said, I know you have, because they're all copying me in. Yeah. So when they invite I'm telling them to do that. So. <laughs> when they invite you to their salon, I said, go. One, you'll learn a lot. Two, you will meet some great people. You will meet a whole new dynamic of young female entrepreneur in your constituency, and you will learn a great deal from them. And you know what? They will be appreciative that you're taking the time to learn. You're not going to go into a a hostile environment, let me tell you, they will be really welcoming, they'll explain what they do, um, and some of it you will find very uncomfortable in the same way that I find nose waxing uncomfortable, but you know, you're going to learn a great deal, so go and find out about this business, because, you know, and I did the maths at some point, if it's 370,000 people employed in the beauty industry across the country, that means in every constituency there is more than 500, there are more than 500 people employed in this sector. That's a massive chunk of your electorate. So go and meet. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I think while we're all celebrating today, and I don't want to detract from that at all, I think there are a lot of people out there who still feel quite angry about how the beauty industry has been treated throughout all of this and, and how they've been spoken about. Um, and, and it's, you know, it, it does smack of sexism on two levels. It's, it's the, the clients are largely women and, and the people that run these businesses are largely women. And, and I think it's, it's largely men that are sort of making these decisions. So I think it's been, it's been difficult to swallow. But, um, you know, do you think that there, what more can people do now to continue this good work, I think, and to sort of keep their voices being heard? Because I think for some people, it's, it's a worry that it's like, right, that's it, we're open, it's good, and, and then the industry isn't necessarily, continues to be champion. This is amazing, great work, but what more can people do? How can they get involved to, to get it a bit more of a voice, I suppose, ongoing? So I think, it, I think it does need a voice going forward. I think um, what has struck me, and this is nowhere criticism, but there have been a lot of very disparate voices. So it's very difficult um, to determine who are the the authoritative informed voices who's speaking up on behalf of the industry as a whole um, and I you know softly be it said but I think there are good arguments to be made in favour of regulation in favour of uh, standards and you know a proper body regulating the industry would give you all somebody to turn to in a crisis who can speak up with an authoritative voice on behalf of you all. So, you know, I absolutely get that there's the National Hair and Beauty Federation and there are a lot of organisations and there's also kind of different, different tiers. So uh, I have discovered things that I never knew, but, you know, there's the whole area of um, medical aesthetics and injectables and, you know, whether they should be delivered only by medics or, uh, or to what level should you have to be trained in order to be able to do that. And I think, uh, and I also heard some people dealing in the world of aesthetics, say, use the phrase, oh, well, that's 
just beauty. Yeah. To which I would always reply, mm, no, there's no such thing as just beauty. This is where the bulk of the people are employed. This is where the bulk of the revenue is. And it's also, and you know, I believe this absolutely passionately, it is the part of the industry that is interacting with so many people every single day, providing you know, things like tackling loneliness. And I always say this, apologies to those who read the article I wrote. You know, I toddle in and get my nails done every two to three weeks, depending on how carefully I've looked after them. Now, usually you end up on a sort of a bit of a rotor. So you go in there and you see the same people having their nails done at the same appointment time on a Friday as I do. And you get to know them and you get to know which ones uh, haven't seen anybody else that week. The ones who are coming in there for a chat and it takes them a while to warm up and, uh, and then they're, you know, they're away and they're laughing along with everyone else. And I think actually part of the experience of going to a salon is you establish a rapport with your therapist. I always say this, my hairdresser and my manicurist know more about me than anybody else on the planet. Yeah. Um, and I have both of them sworn to secrecy all the time. <laughs> but it, you know, it's really true. It's about making people feel better. And you know, whether it's reflexology and a massage, whether it's uh, my personal favorite, an Indian head massage, deals with the migraines every time. Um, it's, you know, it's about enabling people to feel better about themselves. It builds confidence and self-esteem. Um, and it's about getting those messages out there that this isn't just beauty. This isn't something trivial. Uh, I, I very rarely reply to people on Twitter because I think it's a cesspit. But uh, there was one lady who had a real go at me on Twitter and said, I don't know why you're wasting your time with this. It's just vanity. It's not vanity. It's about well-being and it's about people, um, the ability to feel better about themselves, to feel more comfortable in their own skin. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. And, and, I, and I think it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because it's such a broad industry. So it does range from nails and makeup, which again is completely valid and has its place and does help people feel better about themselves. But you know, it, it varies right into um, the more kind of medical type treatments and things that, that have been proven to help with depression. And, and then the power of touch is, is such a huge part of that for massage and, and lots of these sorts of things. And, um, and I think that's the frustration for a lot of people that beauty is just seen as vanity and it's about so much more than that and I think you know we touched on regulation very briefly and I think that's such a difficult one isn't it because do you think that that one of the reasons that the beauty industry has been viewed as not COVID secure during the earlier stages of recovery is that there is no governing body to monitor and prove its safety so I think, I think that's part of it I think um, there was massive lack of understanding of how procedures were carried out, what measures would be in place anyway. Um, and you know, there are some uh, salons have invested enormously in PPE and there are others who have turned to me and said, well, no, not really, because this was what we had anyway. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, this is what we would use on a daily basis. So whilst we may have upgraded and changed a bit and, and you know, done all of those um, important, but slightly disappointing things so you know waiting rooms they're going to be gone aren't they and uh, it becomes that uh, so no more magazines and beautiful flowers it's going to be wait outside until you get a text message saying you can come in um, but you know most most places were very hygienic sterile environments and and there was no understanding about that so i do think um i do think things will change and I think it would be really beneficial to the industry as a whole if there was one united voice speaking on your behalf and I recognize that that's really difficult and probably really controversial and hard to establish and all the rest of that but this crisis has demonstrated the power of having one voice speaking for you I think yeah I think um also the frustration for a lot of people was that um there, most people in the industry have been championing the idea of, of regulation or at least licensing for, for so, so long. And to kind of be told, well, you're not regulated, so we can't know that you're secure, that you know that you're safe, is, is such a sort of a trap to be caught in because it's like, well, you, you won't regulate us. So how are we going to, to, how do we move on from this? You know, could a silver lining in this mean that, that we're a step closer to regulation, do you think, like mandatory regulation? 
Well, so, um, and I always say this, I famously sat on a, a bill committee for the deregulation bill where we were having a bonfire of red tape and uh, at the same time I had it pointed out to me by an opposition MP that I had been calling for better regulation of the hairdressing industry. Um, and so there, there are swings and roundabouts to it and nobody likes bureaucracy, nobody likes red tape. Um, and I'm not sure what sort of space the government's in when it comes to um, me leaping up and down and saying, well, mandatory regulation is the way forward. Um, I think it, it would be helpful. I think it might come to that. But I also think there's a piece of work to do, and I'm uh, the newest recruit to the all-party parliamentary group for uh, beauty and well-being, beauty aesthetics and well-being. Um, and I got a text message literally on a Friday night from one of the existing members say, no, because if you're going to carry on about this the whole time, you did at least ought to sign up to the all-party group, which was, was a fair comment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I have done that. And I have to say, people like Carolyn Harris and Judith Cummings, great, you know, really hardworking, great advocates for the industry. And I know Judith has said quite a lot in Parliament over the past couple of weeks. Um, and, you know, they are... Uh, genuine long-standing advocates for the cause so I don't think I'm going to sit here and say well the APPG is going to call for regulation without first having spoken to them that would be hugely disrespectful of me but um, I can see that that may well be the direction of travel. Yeah well I think most people that are members of that obviously you've mentioned NHBF there's also BABTAC, UK Spa Association, British Beauty Council I think you know it's 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 heartening that everyone has joined together for this APPG and I think most people that are involved in that are, are quite keen on regulation so um, fingers crossed this could become a bit of a silver lining perhaps through all of this that recognition that some of these treatments do involve dangers that, you know aren't are quite quite controversial if you like so I think having some sort of system because I think and um, as we were sort of touching on earlier I think the difficulty is that there is an issue in in the industry with what some will refer to as non-standard salons you know there are salons out there that aren't operating safely um, but the vast vast majority are and the difficulty is that everybody's judged the same way. So unless there's something to separate those that are and those that aren't, it's, it's very difficult, I think, for most people to shout about how, how safe they are and how well they're doing. Um, so I think that's a fair comment. And you're absolutely right. Most salons are uh, absolutely you know, tip top with all of their practices, incredibly hygienic. Um, and you, you tend to hear about the bad and that's the reality. I have, learned many things about the beauty industry over the last uh, two or three weeks. First and foremost, uh, this is not a slur, you guys are the queens of social media. Oh my goodness. Um, so, uh, and, and some of you have been very good at lecturing me on my appalling Instagram. Um, and <laughs> telling me that I, at once. Come on. <laughs> I have to move forward and the, uh, my Instagram is uh, a homage to my dog and don't put any worky stuff on there and I got a very um, accurate uh, for which I'm actually very appreciative lecture from one lady who said you have to move away from Facebook um, because young people don't use Facebook that's for people your age thank you um, so I think that's you know that's really uh, that's really noticeable so you know when people do do good work in the the beauty industry of whatever type you are fabulous absolutely fabulous about promoting that on social media oh my goodness, on a different level. And apologies to anybody who sent me a Facebook message in the past few weeks. I have, I, there are so many of them, I just can't get back to them all. Um, and I, I look at my notifications and I cringe and I go, oh, well, I'm not coping with that. So, you know, good work gets celebrated on social media. Equally, if somebody makes a, a complete mess of someone's, uh, we'll use eyebrows as an example, because that's beloved of the Daily Mail, you will see it on uh, social media, you'll see it in the media. So um, I think uh, that's something I've learned is that, you know, word spreads very quickly and people build their reputations on, uh, on the strength of the work that they do because, you know, it's their writ large on people's faces, isn't it? So you can't get away from having made a mess of someone's face equally. I look at um, some of the, just the most amazing, beautiful photographs, uh, particularly um, some of the stuff that professional makeup artists do. Oh my goodness. Uh, so they are people from whom I could definitely take a lesson. Um, but, you know, it, it's all very much laid out for the world to see. 
And I think that's actually a real strength of the industry is that you can therefore instantly see who's good and who's bad. Um, and the comments will tell you who's good and who's bad. So I don't think regulation is anything to be afraid of because I think uh, the industry already practices to enormously high standards. And I think it could be the way forward. And it also will give people kind of certainty and confidence that they're, um, they're going to somebody who is accredited by a, a respected body. Absolutely, absolutely. So fingers crossed for that. <laughs> we've had absolutely tons of questions while we've been speaking. And um, actually one of the most um, kind of frequent ones that we're, we're having pop through is just, is there any more clarity that every single treatment on the face can be done? Because I suppose people are, I think people are a bit nervous to celebrate completely um, in case any additional guidance comes out. And do you think there might be some further rules, um, you know, about how long you can do a facial for, for example? So I think it's absolutely imperative that I be completely honest here, is that I only know as much as you do. And it would be lovely, wouldn't it, that I might have been given some notice because I wouldn't have spent you know, 24 hours doing the online petition um, that we got up and running and then got thousands and thousands of uh, incredibly quickly. So I don't know. What I hope is that Bayes will issue guidance really quickly. But my understanding is that from the 1st of August, you can work on people's faces um, and there has not been a suggestion of a time limit or, or restriction and, you know, or, or different practices. So I think we can all understand that some might be um, marginally less COVID secure than others. But, you know, the reality is, as I was struck last weekend, you know, you could trim someone's beard, which cannot be done with a mask on. No. Yeah, you can do someone's lashes where both uh, lash artist and customer could be wearing a mask. And I will admit, I've never had false lashes, so I have no idea how long they take. Um, but it, it just struck me that every time I've had my eyebrows shaped, uh, then the wonderful Rena at Maya Jew in Romsey has done it in, you know, maybe five, 10 minutes flat, and that could be done with both of us wearing a mask. So, um, you know, it just made me a little bit cross then, but hopefully there will be guidance will come out. Uh, hopefully there will be absolute clarity that from the 1st of August you can, you know, do the electrolysis, because I know there are a lot of questions around electrolysis, mm -hmm. be able to do the semi-permanent makeup. Um, and, you know, most of all, and this is the thing that struck me as hugely unfair, is that as of um, last week, about I think earlier than that, you could have makeup artists doing makeup for films, Yes. Not a makeup artist doing makeup for a wedding. Mm. And that just made me really angry because we all know if, uh, and I'm much older than everybody who's watching this, but the sort of Mrs. Doubtfire prosthetics, <laughs> uh, Robin Williams always used to say that it took four hours to get him into that makeup. And yet somebody doing uh, professional makeup, you know, whenever I used to have to go and do a television interview, with Sky or the BBC, their makeup artists used to be allowed 10 minutes to uh, do their finest work on my face, and yet they have been allowed to go back, but will now from the 1st of August. Um, so, you know, there were just so many inconsistencies that made me really, really angry. Absolutely. And there's been a lot of, of, of talk about that as well within the industry. I think that one of the very difficult things was um, the wording before where um, about face treatments and it said treatments that take place in a medical environment or I think was the wording um, are not included in this. So I think a lot of aesthetic clinics decided that it was fine for them to open. And in a lot of cases, some of them were doing the exact same treatments that you would get in a beauty salon. And a lot of the time, it, you know, it's not a doctor doing these treatments, a doctor employs a beauty therapist to do these treatments in their medical clinic. So I think the lack of clarity out there has caused a, yeah, a quite a lot of, um, of upset within the industry. So to have a, a more universal ruling that, that makes a lot more sense, I think is, is great news for everybody. Yeah, and it makes, um, and you're dead right, the whole uh, difference between uh, aesthetics carried out in a medical setting as opposed to a non-medical setting, um, you know controversial in itself but i think you know it's about just getting it right and it's about making it fair and mm. it's above all else it's about giving people the opportunity to go back to earning their living and i said that in the house you know these are uh, fiercely independent ballsy women uh, the precise quote and 
if they're not allowed to go back to work, then the next stop for them is the job centre. And none of them want that. They've all established their careers. They've worked really hard in many instances. And I know, you know, you're all looking forward to the 1st of August. That is going to be no picnic because there will be a lot of demand, a lot of pent up demand. It will be school summer holidays. So uh, you'll be juggling childcare around trying to fit in clients literally every hour that God sends. Um, because there's an awful lot of hard work to be done you know, re-establishing build businesses, building up client lists, um, and, you know, grabbing back some clients who may well have been tempted to go elsewhere, underground, grey market. Um, and I've had so many emails from people who say, you know, I've got a salon, I'm not a mobile beauty therapist, so I can't uh, open up and I won't disobey the rules. And so I'm staying at home whilst I know my clients are disappearing elsewhere. Yeah. And you know, that, that helps nobody. And that's been really, really hard to see, I think, because people have been sharing, you know, they've seen people posting on Facebook, offering treatments in homes. They've seen people, you've seen people going into to other people's homes. So it's, it's been happening. And I think the longer that this went on, the, the bigger the fear that that was going to be the way the industry went. And uh, so it's great, it's great news that that's not the case now. Um, I think another question that we're getting quite a, quite a lot of uh, instances of popping through here is about um, the people that have fallen through the gaps in support throughout all of this. I mean, it's obviously they're delighted that they can start to, to work again from the 1st of August, but I think there are some people out there that haven't been able to afford to keep their businesses going, you know, have already closed their businesses or, or are fearing that they may not be able to afford to reopen, they've not been able to access loans. Is there any kind of hope for them? Is there any way that they may be able to access additional funding? Would there, is there likely to be any, any kind of access to that for them? So this was a point that I made to the Treasury um, a couple of days ago. I put down a written question to the Chancellor on this. And that was specifically, and I apologies if I make this sound more complicated than I intend to, but that was specifically around businesses that were forced to remain in lockdown and those that were only able to reopen partially. So if, for argument's sake, facials is 80% of your business or lashes 100% uh, of your business, you remain in lockdown whilst the rest of your industry has been allowed out. So what additional support might there be? Now, I only put that question down a couple of days ago, so I've not had an answer yet. I'm also a member of uh, an all-party group that's described as being for the excluded. So I'm very conscious that when it came to furlough, if you had recently moved jobs, uh, the self-employed uh, support scheme, so that wasn't applicable to people that were both working and self-employed, and in the industry it is not uncommon for argument's sake for you to work part-time in a salon and part-time for yourself, uh, and they fell through that crack. Equally, for those who didn't have three years of account, so the newly established and um, please do feel free to jump on me if I get this wrong. But the thing I have learned is that you will go off and do your qualifications at college and then maybe work for a salon for a few years. And then it's very common to set up on your own, uh, whether in a salon of your own. Uh, as, and I'm going, to, I will, I'm going to sort of tell you a little bit of a story about this in a couple of minutes, um, whether it's in a you know, garage, your dad has converted for you and that's very common so working yeah, from the factory, absolutely or um or a mobile beauty therapist there were an enormous number of really very young women and that was what struck me so you know you could be looking at somebody in their really quite early 20s yeah, yeah. who hadn't been working for long enough to be entitled to the self-employed support scheme and i always remember and i will remember this girl until my dying day um having my nails done years ago before I went on holiday by a beauty therapist who had convinced her dad to convert their garage into a studio for her and it was beautiful absolutely beautiful and I said to her isn't this a bit of a risk setting up on your own at your age she was only about 20 and she said well I went off to college at 16 and I did a two-year course um, and then I went and worked at one of the local hotels in my constituency so I worked in the spa there and she said, and for the minimum wage, I had to massage people all day long because they've come on a break. So actually the treatment they want isn't a facial or mm. they want a massage. Yeah, isn't that hard work? Yeah, 
And that was the point she made to me. She said, you know, when you've done six clients in a day, she said, you are exhausted and you're earning the minimum wage. And she said, so I sat down and I wrote a business plan and worked out that if I was painting other people's nails and that was all I did in my dad's garage, she said that I would be better off. And what was more important to me, she said, I wouldn't be exhausted every night when I went home. Um, and, you know, that is exactly the sort of entrepreneurial young woman that we should be encouraging and helping. Um, absolutely, absolutely. No doubt about that. And, you know, when we start looking at the Chancellor's package for support going forward and the industries that he wants to promote and encourage, and so we thought, you know what, this is an industry where you have entrepreneurs, you have people who are self-starters they make a decision that it is in their own best interest to work for themselves you know what it's exactly the sort of sector that enables people to work flexibly it enables them in some instances to work from home to juggle childcare around it and i just think that if coronavirus has taught us i mean it has taught us a hell of a lot of things but let it teach us that you have to look at kind of the industries that aren't really obvious and where the growth is possible there and where you might see all of those facets of employment that we want to encourage, you know, the flexible working. Mm -hmm. um, we want to encourage people to be traveling less um, and, you know, working close at home. So this is an industry that can really do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I can't sit here and make any great promises um, because I am these days just a, a mere backbench member of parliament, but I, it's given me a real insight into looking at everything through the lens of, do I think women are getting a fair break here? And if not, what could we do that was different, better, uh, to make sure that they do? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's been so fantastic to see and people have really embraced that to, to be recognized as entrepreneurs and most most people in this business are whether they're setting up alone or whether they're running a large huge multi-site spa or salon group there's lots of entrepreneurs one one person has actually commented which we should mention it's quite irresponsible to have allowed a, a therapist to do back-to-back -back massages which is very true i think uh, spas and salons on the whole are very very cautious of their therapists so when they are employing people it should be limited amount of kind of hands on time to avoid injury and again most people do so it's uh, it's i'm it's, glad i didn't name it then <laughs> But yes, I think they shouldn't be doing them back to back. And most people have all these kind of measures in place to protect their teams. And again, this is people doing all of this themselves. They're running their business. They're doing all the kind of staff care and they're still delivering treatments most of the time. But they're managing to do that fantastically. So it's, it's been amazing to see. Um, a lot of the questions we have pop up, I don't know. Again, I, I think you, you've said to us, you probably know as much as us at this stage in terms of um, limitations on treatments, but people are, are sort of quite confused saying, obviously with a facial, you can't wear a mask. Um, is this okay? You know, if you, in the salon, the guidance kind of says at the moment, ask your client to wear a mask, you wear a visor. With facials, the client can't wear a mask, so. No, but I, I would point out that last week beard trimming was okay and the client couldn't wear a mask for that, could they? So I'm assuming that this is, you know, services are open um, and I think it is uh, good practice and common sense for the therapist to, I would wear a visor as well as a mask. I have a bit of a view on visors um, that, you know, I'm not quite sure that they're providing the same level of protection as actually covering uh, your nose and mouth. But um, I am not the expert. I freely admit that. And I just think, you know, you want to keep yourself safe as much as you want to keep your clients safe. So I think it's all about putting in as, as many precautions as are practical. Yeah, absolutely. And I think most salons are. I know a lot of uh, nail salons that have already opened are wearing the visor around the mask together for the, for the nail technicians and the, and the mask for the clients. So I think, yeah, it, it seems to be at all times where it's possible for the client to wear a mask, they keep it on, they take it off for the treatment. And, you know, we're probably assuming that's how facials will work. Um, I've just had a question pop up, which is quite interesting, actually, because I was going to ask kind of to finish about what, what next, really, I suppose, you know, not that we've, we've reached such an amazing milestone today and it's incredible. But I think people are so um, kind of enheartened by this, so enthused by what has been achieved and, and the voice that has been, um, been put forward by, by yourself in Parliament and, 
and the noise that the industry has made on the, in the national media. Um, so what, what can we do to kind of keep this motivation going? Um, Carolyn uh, Bedwell has just, has just asked, can we help you in the future by being part of, of a, a business research group for you, for some of these, or, or for some of these business groups? What can salons do, I suppose, to keep the recognition going and to, to further the cause in? So I think there's a lot of work to be done around uh, keeping the profile up. I think that really matters. I think people have been on a massive learning curve and particularly in Parliament, but also more widely, the general public. So you know, the uneducated woman who told me that it was an industry based on vanity, you know, she really copped it on Twitter, not only from me, but from a whole range of people who are saying, no, this isn't, this is a well-being service. I think there is a lot of work to be done, as I said earlier, around regulation. I certainly am looking forward to getting stuck in with the APBG to discover what the best ways forward are. And I think, um, and I always tell people this, that I, I've made some lifelong friends over the last fortnight, uh, people who have been um, sharing really moving stories, really, uh, really sad stories, but so much hope and so much determination. And that's the thing that really strikes me. These are women with drive and determination. So from my perspective, and I have another four years to serve as chair of the Women in Equality Select Committee, I'm never gonna forget this experience. Uh, and I'm never gonna forget the conversations with people who thought that they had been forgotten and thought that they didn't have a voice and thought that they were being trivialized and marginalized. And if I have kind of one message to the industry. It's, it's you do have a voice, you have a really powerful voice. You are large in number, you are big in contribution to GDP, you're massive in terms of the contribution to well-being. So I know that MPs aren't always the flavor of the month and you, know, you may not like the individual one that you have, but make contact with them and do it routinely. So you know, if there's something that affects your industry, well, there's something that affects you that you see in the press or you uh, hear on television, then contact your member of parliament and let them have your opinion. It's really easy for us to, to make out that we know everything that's going on in our constituencies. We just don't. And I, I found the conversations that I've had with women over the last three weeks now, really, um, have been incredibly enlightening. I found out a great deal more about your industry. I certainly um, hope that I can carry on being uh, a voice to the government to say, look, hang on a minute, uh, I didn't think that you treated this industry fairly back in July. You know, it's October now, what are you doing to help? And I think there are all sorts of interesting questions around VAT, because we all know that the hospitality industry's had a VAT break. Yeah. yeah. You guys haven't. I think there are questions around um as i said earlier apprenticeships and training and grants that might be available and i think you know i get a little bit fed up with hearing that the government wants to focus on construction you know let's be brutally honest that's uh if if there is such a thing as a pink job and a blue job that is very predominantly uh men who are employed in construction there are tiny numbers of women so I would like there to be a focus in the recovery of to how we can um, advantage female-led industries. And I think that that's really important because you can't ignore 50% of the population. You can't pretend that, that workforce doesn't exist. And it's, you know, because we know the sectors in which women are very heavily employed, whether it's retail or hospitality are the sectors that have been worst hit by the virus. So I think there's a lot of work to be done around that. And I think, um, you know, you guys have found a voice, so keep using it. Um, yeah. Because as, I, as I've told all of my colleagues, you know what, these are bright, articulate, determined women. These are, these are people you want on your side. Do not alienate them. Absolutely. And I think anything that we can do to help you do that, I mean, Professional Beauty as a group, we've got about 120,000 active therapists and salon owners on our database you know we're in touch with these people daily and uh, I think we were discussing before right we put out a survey to try and demonstrate the value of, of face treatments which is perhaps not needed now but we had almost 3,000 responses within 48 hours so you know we, people are really passionate and and if we can help you reach people on mass and, and, and feed back to you we'd love to do that in, in any way we can and that's really powerful and a great offer thank you 
Fantastic. And um, well, I think we're kind of coming up to time, but Caroline, thank you so much, not just for joining us today, but for everything that you've done for, for the industry over the, over the last several weeks. It's been so nice, as we've said, and we've had so many incredible comments just saying, I just want to say a heart, heartfelt thank you. You know, we felt we were being forgotten, we felt we were being ignored, and just to have that voice has been has kept people going I think and kept morale up as well as actually achieving results so thank you so much Caroline. Well I've really enjoyed it so thank you. And we shall keep in touch and we'll keep fighting for, for everything else for beauty for regulation and everything else. Brilliant thank you. Thank you Caroline and thanks everyone for joining us. Bye.